Okay. Do you want to do team speak or something too on the side? Uh. No. Okay, so I'm just gonna be hidden, and we're just gonna communicate through Google Doc. Yeah, I guess you can type in comments there, or just type there. You don't have to even type comments because I'm gonna not keep the comments open. Oh, you're not gonna keep comments open during class? No, 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 no. I'm not gonna keep comments at Google Doc because that reduces the screen real estate I have. I mean, I've got okay. so many windows open right now. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a preview of this. So we got to find all those links now. Did you already get them? Uh, for this one, uh, where do I get the live YouTube link? I, you probably don't see it because you're not the organizer. I just okay. sent it to you on the chat. All right, got that now. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> it started playing when I clicked on it, and I started responding too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's the other one. Did that that didn't go? Did that? I'm really confused. Why is it mushing all this together? What dumb? Yeah, that kind of is. Um, all right. So then the there's, public there's one. There's three links there in case you didn't notice. Yeah. So there's the YouTube, the one to the Hangout itself. Oops. Um, so now you got my awesome slide. I don't know if there's a way to make it so that my slide that doesn't work. Test test. Hello hello. Testing one two. Sounds good. Don't really hear you. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Okay, so I'm going to go over this syllabus. Um, and it's basically just, I'm not going to go over everything in detail. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to show them where the calendar is because I think this is kind of hidden. And then I want, uh, I have to screen share this. What happened to that screen? Oh, once I kicked it off to full screen, it stopped screen sharing. Okay, so I want to screen share this window. Mm -hmm. Should I make it wider? If you can. Make it widescreen aspect uh... ratio. Yeah, it's a little difficult. Can you hide the people at the bottom? People at the bottom? Like the picture of me and... Oh, uh, you don't see it right now, but on regular mode, like I show up on the bottom. Oh, yeah. So once I mute you, let me do oh, that. Then. Now, if you're watching the stream, you should disappear. Maybe. <laughs> And then we can zoom in, potentially, is what I was thinking. Oh, that's messing up on the bottom screen. Why does it not look good? Oh, <laughs> that one's not interactive. Uh, one sec. Just mess that one up. I've unmuted you, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. I. Lost a window. How'd you lose a window? I'm getting some weird artifacting on my second monitor. The stream is just a picture of me. What do you mean? The YouTube stream right now is showing up as me. Oh, so every time I unmute you, I have to set which one I want? Apparently. All right, now it's back to yours. 
with me on okay. the bottom. So what I want to do is zoom in like this. I can't see what it looks like right now. Um, it's... It looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then if I do the hover, I can show what the event is. And I can talk about it. Okay, it's a little hard to read. Oh, uh, let me go to bigger picture. Never mind. Okay, so that zoom doesn't work. Um, if I share my desktop, does that help? Um, if you get rid of, if you mute me, it helps a lot. No, 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 no. But the thing is, I'm doing the zoom with like the pinch to zoom on Mac. Oh, okay. It's not working. Hmm. So here I'm sharing. Do you see that zoom? Uh. Are you, are you zooming live? I'm, I'm zooming right now. I don't see anything on my... It's extra. Okay, uh, so that zoom doesn't work, so... I'm not seeing anything. Zoom. I can't... I see that. That worked. Right? Yes, no, that that's, works. That's good. Yes. So I have to do pinch to zoom in Safari. Okay, so it works in Safari, but talk about the whole class. Firefox or Chrome? Uh, no, the other one was just operating system level versus not operating system level. But ideally, we gotcha. just want to share a single window because you see better. So like that. And now we can go over this. Yep. Looks good on the stream, looks good live on the Hangout. So maybe I'll keep this one zoomed in just to start. And just so it's easier transition. Hope so. I don't know. There's a million things to be checking. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you have to worry too too much. As long as you know what you're talking about. All right, we got to start posting the links on Skillshare, um, but I need to take a little break. So I'm going to put up break. the. I'm going to turn you off, and I'm going to put up the thing and. Steph, do you have a headphone set or not? I can't find my other headphone set. I don't have any. Um, the earbuds? Yeah. Um, Hold on, maybe I have TeamSpeak here. All right, I'll pull up TeamSpeak. Mm Or it might be able to just do a voice. Voice uh, through vo some vo something voice through iMessage. Uh, I don't know. No. Um, I've got something on my screen bugging out. I see the calendar. Can you message me the TeamSpeak stuff? I don't have it on this user account. Sure. Um, testing. Oh, why'd that pop up? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know if my computer's gonna like this. It's not liking something. I gotta change some kind of graphic setting. There's a TeamSpeak app for uh, the phone too, if my, that makes it my easier. My problem is I don't have another set of headphones to plug in. Oh, okay. Because my other pair is missing. Mm hmm. Okay. Hide me. I can't hear you if I hide you yet. Did you link me the stuff? Uh, I sent it to 
Where would I send it? Uh, G yeah, chop. Send it in the Chrome. Send it in the Google Hangout. Oh, in the no, Google Hangout. I'm not logged into any chat. Oh, okay. All right. So in Google Hangout, I just sent it. Are you in it? Yes, I'm in. Did you add both of the links to the toolbox? Uh, yes. So the Google Hangout and uh, the YouTube. Uh, did you add the Twitter? And Twitter, yes. And you're on TeamSpeak? And I'm at Guess. Do you think people will be posting on the Skillshare? Anything? That could be. So I should add that one too. Dude, my monitor does not like me. Um, okay, TeamSpeak. Oh, that's the wrong one. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy? <laughs> I connected to the public. Oh, that was the wrong one. Um, add a bookmark. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, the 173B, I was not part of that. Hmm? Oops. Are you still trying to get the TeamSpeak to work? Yeah, I just haven't input all the stuff yet. Uh-oh. Did it join? Hello? Yep. So you can hear that? Mm-hmm. All right, you want to? All right. Let me mute the video. Yeah, you can hear me. Is this really loud? Echoey. Is it picking up from here? I'm just going to turn down my monitor volume so it's not as loud. And skip that. I don't the the bottom the bottom portion of my MacBook Pro screen is flickering like it's a job. <laughs> I I going to get crazy. No, it's just on my computer. Uh, maybe if I were to screen share that, you would see it, but I think it's a graphics glitch. Yeah, I don't see anything. It could be related to the Google Hangout. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch that back to... I also have to remember that when I'm talking to you, everyone's listening. All right, I'm going to mute the mic on the...
Hi guys, it's Paul Soltz, and we'll be starting around 8.05. I'm still waiting for more people to join, so just hang tight, and we'll get started in the next three minutes. Howdy. All right, we're going to get started real soon. Okay, so you guys can comment on either Twitter, YouTube, or Google+. So there's three different ways. The best way right now is to use the YouTube link. So I shared that on Skillshare if you're on that one. If you're on the Google+, just click through and it should take you to YouTube. And then the comments there are the easiest to work with. Um, so if anyone has any questions right off the bat, just post them there. I have a friend helping me log all the questions, and we'll address questions at the end of the session. If we don't have time to go over everything, then we will post in a discussion or maybe a follow-up video so that you guys can read or watch stuff later.
Hi, Laura. All right, so let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Solt, and I'm an iPhone and iPad developer. I've been making apps for the past three years, and I've worked for Apple and Microsoft in internships, and I have five apps on the App Store. So I have a little bit of experience doing app development, and I have a little bit more experience probably doing the marketing and testing out different things just to see what works and what doesn't work. And for me, it's been a, a learning experience. Uh, I didn't want to work for a big company after I did my internships. I, I really didn't like working on someone else's project, and I started my own software company called Artwork Evolution. So I do have a background in teaching. I've worked as an adjunct professor at RIT, and I've also worked as a computer science lab instructor for some of the undergraduate classes. So with all of that, I've had a lot of hands-on activities with students, teaching them from scratch to teaching people who are experienced programmers. So I've sort of taught both sides to the spectrum, and I think I kind of understand how people learn and how people understand material. With that said, um, I'm definitely not a teaching expert, but I think that I can relate to you and I can communicate in a way that you guys can pick up and understand what I'm talking about. All right. So, <clears throat> I've lost my water bottle. <clears throat> I've got a lot of things. Right now, I've set everything up so that I have a standing desk. So this is a little bit different, but I've gotten into standing while I code and standing while I work. And it's easier for me to sort of move around a little bit. So you'll see me moving around, and that's because I'm shifting my weight on my toes. So the whole point of this class is to really teach you how to make apps. And we're going to work on getting your Mac set up. So if you haven't done that already, I've posted a lot of things on the Skillshare discussions. And we'll go into working with some code tonight. I'll go over some basics so that you can understand what's going on. And really want this class to be a way for you to learn how to make apps without having to consult someone else. So you should be able to teach yourself the skills necessary to teach yourself how to make apps rather than just me showing you how to make apps. This isn't just uh, a copy class where you just do everything I do and you don't experiment. You really have to try things because this is a, an immersive learning experience and we're doing that style of teaching where you have multiple sources of information. So. I'm a source of information with my live videos and my recorded videos, but you also have the iPhone book and the Objective-C book that I've recommended from the Big Nerd Ranch. And they're going to talk about things a little bit differently than I will talk about in class. And that's okay because you need different people saying different things for the information to really soak in. Beyond that, if there's a lot of questions I might do additional questions and answers or office hours to answer those types of questions or I might film videos so there's certain technologies or tools that we'll be using that it might not be easy to understand what's going on and if that's the case I'll put together some additional materials so that you can watch on your own time. I'm gonna try and keep all of our live lectures to about an hour. Today we might go over by five or ten minutes just because we started a little bit after uh, but for the most part we should stay on track so hopefully that will work with your schedule so that I don't keep you up late at night if you're not a, a night person and what's next alright so for this week we're really having to work on learning Objective-C so I don't have a whole lot planned in the beginning because it's really up to you to start reading the materials watching the videos and learning on your own and then coming back as a group uh, if you aren't already in a a group on the Skillshare discussions um, so there's sort of a separation for there's two different discussions that you can join there's the group discussion and then there's the public discussion and one is sort of private, whereas the other one's more public. 
So I would recommend joining one of those groups so that you can find someone with a similar interest or someone who's in a geographic location that you are so that you can connect with them to work on apps together or at least bounce ideas back and forth. What I find when I develop or when I work on things is if I have someone else who I can sort of just bounce an idea off of, then I'm better than if I didn't. So it just helps me think about things from a different perspective. You're forced to dumb down ideas so that they're understandable to someone who's maybe not technical. Uh, and then going along with that reading, uh, for the, the assigned reading each week that we'll have, you'll probably want to spend an hour or two a night reading. I'm, it might sound like a lot, but if you really want to learn this material, you're going to learn the best if you're following along with the material as the class is going. It's going to be harder for you to find the motivation to stick with it after the class starts or ends. So just make sure that you're putting time aside each week to stay up on all of the reading that we have. And then alongside the reading is actual practice. So if you're not writing code as you're reading, then you're not going to be learning as effectively as if you're just reading, reading and doing the practice. So that's important. Uh, and lastly, I want to go over the syllabus a little bit. I'm not going to go into crazy detail, but I want to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to bring up the screen share for that. So if you see what we're looking at here, this is the class schedule and you'll see that tonight is our first kickoff. All of the times are in the Eastern time zone since I'm in Rochester, New York. Uh, the first thing we have this week is a deliverable on Thursday and I just want you to submit your project online. So a lot of people have already submitted their projects online. I'll give a little demo of one of those projects in a second. Next class where we actually dig into more iPhone development will be on Saturday at 1 p.m. and then we'll have our office hours on February 4th that's a Monday at 8 p.m. so most of the the weekday classes are at 8 p.m. and then our weekend classes are at 1 p.m. and they should stick to about an hour I'm gonna try and open up the stream half hour early and try to get it out onto the Skillshare discussions and the syllabus so that you guys can join. There's a, a lot of juggling I have to do with all the uh, screens I have on my desktop, but I think we'll be able to get it posted sooner so that you can have some more time to prepare. And our first real checkpoint with you developing your app will be next week on Wednesday. So between now and then, you should be learning the material, uh, learning Objective-C, learning some C, and then learning how to use Xcode. Um, then we've got a bunch of other things. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the class will end with a demo day and moving forward. Uh, we might be highlighting some of the projects in that demo day. And I haven't decided yet if we're going to do a live stream with the participants who've worked on the projects. If we do, I'll... I'll send something out, or you can comment in the discussions if you think that's a, a fun idea. I'm looking for input in this class. This is the biggest class I've taught. My next biggest class was 28 students, so it's going to be a little bit different managing uh, 600 and some people, but I'm willing to give it a try, and bear with me if I don't respond to your emails right away. It's easier for me to respond on Skillshare's discussions, so if you have something that you think is beneficial for the group, post it there. Hmm. Okay. So, let's jump through the website a little bit more. All right, so this is the Skillshare website, and this is what you guys see. Now, the important part is this Classroom tab. This is where you'll find all of the information 
that you need to work with. So if you look where my mouse is, if it's showing up, uh, it's in the middle of the screen. You'll see classroom and then the size. And then on the left, you'll see the syllabus. So there's three modules. You can click on the different modules on the left to switch between them. And that will update the screen. So we're going to first start with the first module. And if you scroll down on that, uh, just under the pre-class stuff, you'll see module one. And this will go into the stuff that we're doing. I've posted a link. I, I will, sorry, I take that back. I will be editing this uh, right after class with the links to the beginning uh, programming series. I've been recording videos to post on YouTube and I have a playlist for you guys to watch. So that will be updated. Um, then I've got some other links in there to watch. Uh, we've got some discussion topics, so I want you guys to take a look at these questions and let me know what you think. Post on the discussions either in the big discussion or in your group discussion. I think it'd be good to start talking more with the people in this class because you'll learn more from them probably than you will just from me. And then our project milestone is this thing and that's our office hours. So that's for this week. Uh, the Saturday class would be in the next module so if we jump to that real quick I'll scroll to the bottom. Sorry for the lag on the scrolling. So Saturday, February 2nd is going to be our next class and it's going to be at 1 p.m. So I'll try and open the stream at 12.30, maybe a little bit earlier. It does take a little bit of work for me to get the link out to all the different websites and emails. Okay, so now that the syllabus is pretty much out of the way, and we've talked about the next class and the deadlines that we have this week, we're ready to dive into some a mini lecture that I prepared, and this is sort of built off some of the videos I've been recording. I think it would be a nice introduction. You're not going to remember everything you see from this. Uh, you might have to watch this a second time to really understand what's going on. But I would also recommend watching uh, the videos that I'm recording so that you can reinforce the material uh, from a different point of view. All right, so hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. And let's start that presentation. I'm going to switch windows. All right, so this is the iPhone kickoff class. And we're going to dig into the mini lecture since we've covered the other materials. So get ready, uh, grab a drink, um, and have fun. So today we're going to start with variables. This is one of the core components in a programming language. And this allows us to store information, retrieve the information, and modify it. So we can look at a single line of code. And here I have something that reads int age is 26. This is C and Objective-C. It's pretty much, it can be used in either language. Um, we're going to start with some C programming, and then we'll move into the Objective-C, because Objective-C is built on C. So the first part that we're looking at is the type. And this is a classifier that tells the computer what kind of information you want to store. So types of information that we would want to store are pictures, videos, songs, or text in addition to numbers. So in this case the int is a keyword which is why it's in a different color and it's short for integer. That means that it's a whole number like 1, 2, 3, 4, or it's even a negative number like negative 25. The next part we have here is an alias or a name. and In this case we have age. This is much like how we refer to someone as Bob or someone else as Tom. 
we want to give a, a name to information that we store so that we can retrieve it later using that name. The next part is the expression. Here we just have a number. We could have a math operation, so it could be something like 26 plus 1. The computer would then take that, evaluate it, and turn it into 27, and then it would use that value. On the bottom we have the assignment operator. So this is the part that's connecting the two components. We have a, a left side and a right side and you can think of this not as the equal sign but as an arrow that's pointing from right to left. So information on the right side is being moved over into information on the left side. And so what we're doing on this line of code is creating a variable in the computer so that we can use it later. I like to think of this as a sticky note. So here's a sticky note representing this information. You, It's like writing on a sticky note, sticking on a wall and getting some piece of information later. So maybe it's a phone number that you're storing. You'd write on your sticky note, you'd remember that it's Bob's phone number and you could come back to it and call him for lunch tomorrow. So that's the basics of reading a single line of code. Now let's talk about types real quick. There's different kinds of information like I was alluding to before with the images and the music. We also have different types of numbers and characters and these things called pointers and structures. So when you're looking at computer memory, you have different amounts of information that you can store in different size blocks of memory. So you can think of it like having uh, a gigabyte to store an integer number, which could be a really, 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 really big number. Or you could have maybe just uh, a kilobyte to store that. That would be a smaller number, or that would be a smaller amount of text, or that would be a smaller movie, however you want to think about it. So. Here we have int, short, and long. These all are keywords for integers. Short is the smallest, int is in the middle, and then long is the longest. Then when we want to work with uh, decimal place numbers, like 3.14, we'd use a float or a double. If we want to work with text, we have characters. We use the care keyword, and so we could have a single letter. Pointers are special. We can use one of the existing types, and rather than storing the value, we store a memory address. So this is kind of like storing someone's house address and then referring to it later, and then maybe telling a contractor to go paint this house at Cinnamon Drive Blue. So the pointer gives us a reference to some address that we can then look up and modify that thing. And we can store numbers, so an int star would give us a pointer to an integer. And that would give us that memory address so that we can look them up in the address book. And then the last one we have here is a struct. This is short for structure. And this you can think of a, as a composition of things. So if you want to store an x coordinate from the Cartesian plane, well, along with the y coordinate, you wouldn't just want to have a single float. So you wouldn't just do float x. You'd want to create a structure called point and then give the point two values. It can have an x and a y coordinate. And that way you can treat it as a single object. And using these different data types, we can create really complex programs. And we can organize information in a way that makes sense to a human. And so that's really the whole point of programming languages is we want to understand what's going on so that we can write really cool apps. All right, so the next topic is Xcode. Xcode is like the word processor you use Word for writing documents or books or magazine articles. This we use to make our computer programs. When we're using it, for the first time, we'll see this screen. If you click on that Create New Project, it'll start a new project for you. Or you can click on 
the file new project there's a hotkey for that that is shift command n and so if you press that when you're in xcode it will start a new project for you if you click on either of those two options we've seen on these two screens you'll see the next screen so this is the new project screen and there's multiple things to look at we're going to focus on the left side when we start an application and we're just learning C programming or Objective-C programming, we will just create an OSX application. This is a lot simpler than just starting with an iOS application. And we'll choose the command line tool because this allows us to actually write small amounts of code without any user interface and it's without all the clutter. Next you give it a name and you can specify your organization. In this case I chose Paul Solt. The company identifier is something that's unique. Apple wants you to use reverse DNS and all that means is that you're using a reverse website. So you can pretend that you own the website with your name and just do com.myname. Next we select the type and in this case we're going to do C. If you want to do Objective C you would choose foundation and that would give you objective C. Keep that checkbox and then hit the next button. Alright so that's a little bit about getting started with Xcode. Now let's look at how we can interact with output. So when we have a simple program like this it probably looks really complex to you but this isn't really doing a whole lot the first thing we see here is the int main and this is the most important line because this is the starting point for any program that we will be writing for iPhone or for Mac underneath that we see two forward slashes those are comments where you can write notes to yourself or to someone else below that we have a printf command that is taking text between two quotation marks and it's going to print it to the screen printf stands for print formatted and it allows you to do uh, printing of text along with printing of numbers and we'll look into that in a demo in a few minutes now when I say printing I'm not talking about printing a piece of paper I'm talking about taking whatever information is between those quotation marks and displaying it on the screen for the user to see so when we are in Xcode we'll see the code so it looks something like this and then when I hit the run button in the top left we'll see output on the bottom so you can see that it displayed howdy under owl output at the bottom of the screen so this is how we're going to interact with the computer and understand what we're doing and the last thing that I want to touch upon are functions I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here I'm going to keep some of this up in the air. If you're doing the reading, you'll get more into this, I think, in Chapter 5 of the Objective-C book. But functions are basically like blueprints or instructions for how to put something together. So if you've ever put together furniture from Ikea or Walmart or Target, they usually have instructions on how to do something. After you finish putting it together, you get that final output, which gives you that desk or that bed or that chair or that end table and so the the actions that you do through that instruction manual can be thought of as a function so if you were on an assembly line we could use you to keep creating new objects we give you the raw parts which is the input you have the instructions which is basically a set of code and then your output is that furniture and so that's basically what we do when we're doing computer programming we're following a set of instructions to do something and there's input and output and that's all it is so now let's get into some live coding Can move my mic over alright so if you guys have questions please post them on YouTube Nick is monitoring that and hopefully he's typing responses. I'm, I'm seeing some responses there, so it looks like there's some activity. 
Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into Xcode. So I'm going to screen share. I'm going to screen share one of these windows. Okay, it looks like Google Hangouts doesn't work with spaces. One second. Just going to make this a little bit smaller so we can see what's going on. Apparently, Google Hangouts doesn't like Xcode. All right, so here is Xcode. I'm sorry. This is a little bit smaller than I wanted. Next time, I think we'll not use spaces because it looks like Google Hangouts doesn't like spaces. And if you don't know what spaces is, don't worry. Everything's okay. So, we saw this screen earlier, and now let's actually use it. So I'm going to create a new project. And it's going to pop up. And instead of going for iPhone right off the bat, we're going to start with application and then select command line tool. So if you're trying to follow along right now, I'll, I'll give you a couple breaks, but I'm not going to slow down too much because we have a lot to go over. You can just rewatch this if it's unclear since we've already seen a lot of this. So next I'll give it a product name. So this is going to be our first C program. And I'm going to stick with my name, my company identifier. Under here, I'm just going to go with C, like I said before. If you want to try Objective-C, do Foundation. And then we'll keep automatic reference counting. That's one of those new features in Xcode, which is why you need either Lion or Mountain Lion to do iPhone development. And then we'll just save this to our desktop. You can keep this checkbox unchecked. We'll get into Git in a different video. So here is our first program. And there's a lot of stuff we see on the screen. We can actually hide some of this so that we can see our code. And then it is right here. So. Now, if I hit that play button in the top right, top left, it will start the application. So I'll hit that, and we should see Hello World. So if you're creating your first program, this is the same type of code that you would see. The top portion are comments, like I had mentioned before. This is including additional files so that we don't have to write additional code. And that sets up stuff for the printf command. So int main is our starting point. And then we can insert code anywhere in this middle region to do stuff. So if I wanted to print something else like, what kind of dog should I get? And then I save it and I hit the run button. 
Now our output window on the bottom is going to display hello world, what kind of dog should I get? I don't really want to say hello world, so I'll just delete that. And then if we run it again, it'll post the question. Uh, so this is a serious question, so if you have any suggestions, please let me know. And then we can change this to whatever we want. So we could print something like a, a day. And we can use formatting codes to print out certain numbers. So I'm just going to go through and print something like this. And we go ahead and run it. And we see 28. So when I said that this is print formatted, that means that it can take special tokens and recognize values. We could also create a variable, like I did in the slide, and then we could print that out. So now we see both pieces of information, but they appear on the same line. There's a special token, it's the slash n, that will allow us to get a new line or a carriage return so that it separates into two separate lines instead of one line on the bottom. So we run it again, and now we have two lines. And if you want an extra line in between, you just do that. So a lot of this is experimentation. If you're reading the book, this is a good place to start. You just open up Xcode, start typing some code, try some stuff out. So what we're working with here, printf, this is a function. So much like I talked about the IKEA furniture building, that's sort of what this does. The same with the main function. So this is a basic overview. Now I want to just show you how to get started with an iPhone app. So we'll close this. We'll start a new project. And I'm going to select application on the top left and then I'm going to select single view and then I'm going to hit next I'm going to call it my app here I'm going to uh, turn off storyboards and turn off tests because we don't need those and I'm going to make this just iPhone if you wanted just an iPad app because you only have an iPad you could choose that here it'll create the user interfaces for you so let's choose iPhone and then we hit next we save it apparently I've already done this we can turn off the sidebar and show you the code so now as you can see we've got way more stuff here and this might be a little bit more intimidating uh, to get started with but the nice thing is we have this interface designer that we can link up to code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the assistant editor and this is how I like to work when I'm using interfaces and we can see our user interface on the left side and we can see code on the right side. Now just to get you rolling with this you're going to have to open up that sidebar with the top thing and then you'll see the objects which is this little cube so there's a four things alright I changed the size of the window which might have caused the video to go out so we can see all these different things that I can add and it's just drag and drop which is really fun so if you're looking for a way to prototype I find this to be better than any other tool that I've mentioned online for prototyping this or actually designing the interface on a piece of paper with a pen or a pencil so I can drag out different components I can resize them I can rename them we can change colors as well um, so if we uh, one of the things I like to do is instead of once you understand what the components are that you're dragging out 
you can switch to the grid view which shows you more things there's gesture support in here there's advertising there's pickers there's image views so we have all these different components that we can work with on these screens so it's a lot of fun um, just to get an idea of how your apps gonna look and to show you how to change colors we can select something like the background color and make it like a crazy color maybe even just make it red probably doesn't look great right now but you could play with this you can stylize the buttons so that they have images and then when you're ready to go this app works right out the bat uh, unless we've broken something which we did it's trying to build it for my iPhone so okay before so running the Mac app was simpler because we didn't have configuration issues with devices once we get into iPhone programming we have configuration issues so there's certain things that need to be set up and if your computer is not set up to do a device because you didn't pay for the developer license then you won't be able to run it on your phone and it looks like mine expired so I can't test on my phone for this presentation but we'll show you that on our next class on Saturday so to fix that red error just switch to the simulator and hit run and we should see succeeded and then if we're lucky the iPhone simulator will appear but mine's hidden and there we have our app so so hopefully you can see the iPhone app uh, along with Xcode and then you can actually interact with these buttons you can type text uh, the keyboard won't disappear we actually have the right code to make that go away uh, we can click buttons and so this is the beginnings of making an iPhone app so if you want to take a screenshot so when you're working on your projects just do command shift 4 and then you can drag and take a screenshot and I'll save it to your desktop or you can do command shift 3 oh sorry command shift 4 and then press spacebar it turns into a camera icon and now whatever window you're on it will take a picture of that window so if I want to take a screenshot of this I just click this and then we're good to go okay so that's really all I want to go over today this is just an introduction we want to make sure that you're set up for development we want to make sure that you're starting to read the materials watching the videos I'm posting a series on beginning coding so if the material that I presented in the mini lecture was a little bit fast I've got some slower paced videos for you to start watching and I'm still working on those it takes me about an hour or so for just a three to five minute video so there's a lot of editing that I'm playing around with right now but hopefully uh, by Wednesday all of my introductory material will be available for you and it's basically just going to supplement or complement the material that you're reading in the Big Nerd Ranch books. So if you didn't pick up the books, my videos will provide a lot of the information. They won't provide it all because I can't go into detail on everything, but it's a good starting point. So now we're just going to go into Q&A, since that's everything I want to present on, and if we have questions, we'll answer those. Uh, sorry guys I was supposed to get a video I have to click too many times alright so ask away if you haven't asked already or I'll start going off the questions that we already have
uh, one second. Okay, so the first question I have here is will the Xcode software update affect how pertinent the Big Nerd Ranch books are? I don't know. I haven't started the software, so I don't know what it looks like yet. I'm assuming no. Uh, if Xcode turns into Xcode 5, then I would assume that the user interface would change, but until that happens, I think most of the stuff will stay the same. When I was looking at the description, it looked like it was enhancements for the errors and enhancements for the feedback that it gives you. So overall it should just make the application work better. Uh, by next class I'm expecting you to read at least 8 to 14 chapters of the Objective-C programming book. You really should get through 14 chapters but I know that's a lot of material so if you don't do that by Saturday that's okay. Uh, on Saturday we will start digging into Objective-C more so that if you don't have the foundation uh, in C programming which is covered in that first in that first book uh, the Objective-C programming guide from Big Nerd Ranch you'll be behind uh, and then in terms of reading the iOS book, you can start to skim maybe the first chapter or two uh, for Saturday. Uh, definitely read that by the class in the next week. So two to four chapters a night should get you on track. And while you're doing that, you'll want to... While you're doing that, you're going to want to open up Xcode just like I was showing you tonight and just play around with code. Type stuff, you're going to make errors, and you're going to learn how to recover from them. In a couple videos that I'm publishing, I'll show how to recover from errors so that you can sort of get an idea of what I think when I run into issues. Uh, Abraham's wanting to know if we're reading the chapters in three weeks. No, you're actually reading them before three weeks because you need to start making apps. Laura wants to know about choosing between the two books. The Objective-C one is definitely the thing to get if you're going to get one of them. Especially if you don't have any programming experience, that one will cover all the essential information so that you'll be able to read the free resources online about iPhone programming. And the, the Kindle versions of all these books, those are cheaper than the actual printed book. So if you're looking to save money, get those. I really like them. I have them on my iPad. So if you have a Kindle or if you have an iPad, it's a, a really good thing to have a sort of a second screen. Or uh, there's Mac apps for it so that you can... You can read it while you're typing on the computer, so I find that helpful. All right, Matthew wants to know about creating teams of one to three. Uh, the point of the teams was either to work on the same app together or just to have someone that you can text or IM questions you have and sort of help you push through the material. And some people might find it easier to work on a team if they don't have a Mac. Um, but I'm going to guess that the majority of the class isn't in the same geographic region. So the only way that you can work as a team is if you use the Skype video chat or the Google Hangouts like we're using right now or FaceTime. So it's a little bit more challenging to work on a team potentially if you're not located in the same region. But if you have a friend who's interested, by all means, invite them to sit with you during this class, and you two can work together through the material, watch the videos, and do the reading. Uh, Hi, the screenshot is on your desktop, so you need to show all the windows, and you can use the expose to do that, where you just spread your fingers on the trackpad. So if you have a trackpad, you can just do this, and it should show everything. 
So the deadline for the project on Thursday is to give you something to push you forward. If I don't give you deadlines, you're just going to keep putting stuff off. And all I'm looking for is what your idea is so that I can give you feedback before you start working on it. So it's really important that I can give you feedback and that other students in the class can give you feedback on what your idea is. In my opinion, ideas tend to grow when multiple people are interacting with them. And my ideas by themselves are not as good as ideas that I can leverage from other people. And I've definitely seen this with my own iPhone apps. Uh, I've improved them based on the feedback from other people. What I thought was intuitive was not intuitive. Uh, just saying something's intuitive doesn't make it intuitive, no matter how much you say it. So that's why I like sharing ideas and chatting with people. Uh, in terms of Stanford classes, those are good, but they're more oriented to someone who has some programming background. So if you don't have programming background, it might be hard to follow the material. It might not. It depends on your learning style. I found them good, but I am already a programmer, so I understood a lot of the concepts that they were talking about. And that might not be the case if you're a designer or if you're an HTML or CSS coder, or maybe if you work at a production company doing theater stuff. So. Those are good supplemental material. It might be good to just listen to them on fast forward so that you can just get a general idea of what they're talking about. That's a good technique to pick up new information. You just sort of skim through the material just to sort of understand the scope and then you really dig into it and try and learn specific parts. Uh, Kylie, in terms of getting the developer license, it's not important unless you need to test on your iPhone. So if I want to write an app that runs on my phone or I want to write an app that runs on my iPad, then I'm going to need that dev license to actually get it from my computer onto the device. And if you're planning to submit your app to the App Store, then you need it so that you can upload to Apple. So that's the only two situations where you need to get the dev license if you're just starting I recommend not buying it for the first six months that I was doing iPhone development I did it all through Xcode and the simulator that I showed you in tonight's video All right, so Celia is wondering about the UI. So in the interface that I was showing, you can change the background colors and you can also add images. You can customize the buttons and replace them. I'll probably make a video on how to do that. Uh, I don't have time tonight to go into details, but I will write that down so that I remember to get back to you on that. In, in terms of designing your own components, you can replace certain user interface uh, widgets or buttons and the likeness uh, with whatever images you want. And you can have sort of, sort of like you have hover state uh, online, except in this case, your buttons are going to be either not pressed or pressed. And then you can have two different images for that. There's also more custom stuff that you can do, but that's going to be probably a little out of scope. I'm thinking of offering another class on customizing your user interfaces, which would build off of the information that you'll learn in this class. The extra file that we saw uh, in that C program with the .l was just a support file. Um, and that's just uh, stuff that's not really important. I actually don't know what it is um, in that example. They're usually strings or something associated with the project settings. So I wouldn't worry about that. There's a lot of stuff you're going to see in Xcode that's going to be like, I don't know what this is, and that's fine. Don't worry about it. Focus on what the book's talking about or the different topics are and work your way towards it. If there's something you don't understand, write it down so that you can come back to it later. 
And if you keep some kind of journal, you can check off things once you figure out what they are, or come back to them and write down what they are. Uh, some killer will be, we're going to be doing coding and we're going to use the nib files. Um, there are the XIB files and we won't really be getting into the storyboarding. I might do a video on that and I'll take a note for that. So, I don't like using storyboards except for certain situations. Uh, most of the time I find that working with the actual interface file that I showed off where I was coloring the background red, I find that to be a lot easier to manage. There's certain limitations with the storyboard and the Big Nerd Ranch books do not go over storyboard design. So their approach is the approach that I'll be taking for this class. All right, Greg wants me to start an app again. I can get crazy. Yep. All right, so the interface file, I was calling it a nib file. They used to start with a .nib. Now the new format is .xib, and you'll see that in the top right, it says view controller .xib. And so we can customize the background. I think someone was asking about this. So when you click on the background on the right bar, so if your bar is hidden, you need to make sure that's visible. And then I, I guess I didn't go over all the tabs here because I did this pretty quickly. There's different tabs. So there's a lot of options in Xcode, and it gets really complex. The ones you really care about are this one right underneath View. It's called the Attributes Inspector. And then the Measurement, or the Size Inspector, is also pretty useful. So there's a ton of settings on here, and we'll be learning about some of them in some of the videos and some of the live lectures later in the week. But if you just click on the Background button, you can change the color. And... I can show you a image real quick. So what I'm going to do here is I just took a screenshot of the phone. So I have a PNG image on the screen. And then you can drag and drop images into your Xcode project. And you want to make sure that you copy items. So check this checkbox and then make sure it's added to your target and hit finish. Okay, once we do that we have an image to work with so you can see it here and then in our XIB file we have that image you added just for kicks I will add that image so someone was asking about customizing the interfaces once you drag images in, like I did on the left, then in the interface file, we can reference those. So we select our image view. So this is all drag and drop and clickable. And for the image, there's a drop down, and we choose iPhone. And so here we see our iPhone. And then for the other state, we can choose another picture. So in this case, I only have one. Um, but if this was a button or something like that, we'd be able to flip-flop. So like a button has different states, and you can have an image for a button. This is going to look weird, but there's our image button iPhone. And so now we have images associated with these different UI components. You can change the skills, scale or the mode so that we can fit the image within the constraints and different things like that. So there's a whole lot of customization. We're not going to really get much deeper than that. But now if we stop and rerun, our iPhone appears. We see the same exact thing, thing that we saw on the left on the iPhone. And this is not clickable, but this button is clickable. And it's displaying our button on top of the thing. Uh, if you really want to customize the button, you have to actually change the style from rounded rec to custom. 
that will get rid of the background and this allows you to fully customize it so that when we run it again it's different we can then customize the down state to something else when I'm clicking right now it just gets darker so that's a real simple way to customize stuff I know that looks a little bit weird but that should answer some of those questions about that Ross the best first read for understanding Xcode is the Big Nerd Ranch Objective C book and then I have videos that I will post on the discussions uh, so I'm going to create a class notes for from this session and I have a series or you can look on YouTube I'm not sure if it's public yet um, but I'll be making it public so that you guys can find it so that you can understand how Xcode works I do spend a lot more time in my one video on working with Xcode we will be coding from scratch as well as doing the drag and drop it really depends on the app but all of all of my interfaces so I've worked on five different apps three of them are three distinct apps I would say um, two of them are just free versions that have some various features and almost all of them are custom interfaces but I do have some components that I built in interface builder just to show certain information Michael wants to know what Mac apps I recommend to read while typing. Um, the Kindle app is the only reader app that I use. And I think that's free from Amazon. I don't... The only other thing I'm reading is the internet. And... I guess the resources that I recommend are Stack Overflow and the Dev Forums. So I can, I guess, pull up. Uh, let's see. Got to switch screens again. All right, we've got, I think, at most 10 more minutes of Q&A, and then I'm going to shut it down. I'll answer any other questions by text, but... We're pretty much done, uh, so if you have any last questions, type them now, and we'll compile them into a big document and post it on Skillshare once we have all the answers and the links to the answers. So Stack Overflow is a really good site to learn how to develop apps. If you search on it on the top right, you can search for iPhone, and you'll find a lot of things on iPhone development. So lots of answers, lots of problems. If you're having a specific crash, you can search for certain things. Uh, so you just type whatever you're looking for, and usually someone else has seen some kind of issue, and there's usually a check mark that indicates that someone solved it. That's really good. The next thing I would recommend is developer.apple.com. And then beyond that, uh, you have devforums.apple.com. And if you log into that, you have to create a, an Apple ID, then you can see stuff. So there's a getting started section here on the dev forums from Apple. And if you click that, you can see other people's questions. So it looks like there's a sticky note about the Stanford classes. Going on. It looks like there's a new class. So if you're looking for an updated Stanford class, it looks like they're teaching it right now for iOS 6. So that's neat. Um, that's another great free resource. So if you're looking for more information that's free beyond this class, uh, check it out. Okay, let's go back to the questions. Uh, the original iPad only runs iOS 5. 
you might have to jump through some hoops to install some older SDKs on it. I'm not sure if Xcode 4.6 or Xcode 4.5.2 ship with the old iPhone 5 software. Uh, I'll have to come back to that. I'll respond in the show notes. JB, these videos will be on my YouTube account and my Skillshare class. I'm not sure if they'll be on my public page. It might just be on a special link that I share through Skillshare. Just because the class is a paid class and it, not all the content's free. Some of the content's free, but this type of stuff isn't. Yep, I'm going to put all the links for the class in the showroom, or sorry, in the Skillshare classroom. I, Stephanie, I don't think you get access to the iMessage API. Lori, the simulator is part of the Xcode download, so once you download that, you're good to go. Rodrigo, your app can be targeted for either iPhone or iPhone 5. There's different ways to stretch out the user interface for those. There's this new thing called the auto layout. I won't really get into that much, but it is possible. Uh, when you build it, it will just resize things automatically if you're doing the drag and drop like we did in this class. Roger, if you're having a question about how I got somewhere, uh, I need more information on what part you're stuck at. Wes, I would recommend reading as many chapters as you can by Saturday. It'll at least give you the information you need to leverage for going forward. This class is going to be a good amount of work. I'm estimating five to eight hours a week. So if you want to learn to make apps, you're going to have to put in some time. And I'm here to help. So I think you have a really good resource. Uh, it's hard to find developers who are willing to teach, and it's really hard to find developers who can communicate better than just stare at a computer. So I'm going to do my best to be your guide and coach in this class. Uh, Terry Ann, I don't know what you mean by sending elements backwards or forwards in the design. Do you mean like going from one screen to the next? If so, then the storyboard thing might be nice, and I'm going to try and do a video of how that works if you just want to lay out how an application would look to sort of mock it up. Uh, Dave, there are source code that you can see online. Uh, if you go to the developer.apple.com website and you log in under iOS, there's a ton of sample applications. I also believe that they're installed on your Mac when you install uh, Xcode. There is documentation that can be downloaded so that you can get a bunch of those apps, but the easiest place is just to go to the developer.apple.com slash iOS and then search for a simple apps they have basically apps for different technologies. Another good resource is the WWDC videos. Those are published every year with the Worldwide Developer Conference that Apple hosts. That's usually when Steve Jobs would present the new iPhone or the new operating system. And those have really good videos. Uh, Jamal, you can do animation. Um, in Xcode, but it's usually programmatic. So it's not like Flash, where you can just sort of have a timeline and queue things up. Uh, yes, you can access Contacts API. Lori, the difference between the XIB file and Storyboard is that the XIB file is older um, and the storyboard is new. Uh, the biggest difference you'll see is that the 
it's easier uh, and this might not be an issue for you but when you're working on a team and you have multiple people working on an interface it's easier to work on a single file uh, on a single component than it is to work on a, a file that contains all the components so when a file contains all the components if someone's changing it then the other people can't work on it but if you use the XIB files then you can make files that are specific to a particular interface and then multiple designers can be working on the interface rather than locking it down with one designer working on a storyboard so that's sort of the biggest difference um, there are some nice things about storyboard it is good for working with list views and we will get probably into that when you want to customize um, some list views so in week three I think we'll touch upon storyboards from that perspective Uh, Kimberly, I think it's best to start with Mac just to play around with the language. And so don't really think about building an app from scratch right away. Your first probably five times that you mess around with Xcode, you're just going to be experimenting with code, typing stuff, making errors, and following along in the book. So it's best to start with the Mac app because there's the least amount of configurations and you don't have to worry about the simulator working or not working uh, and then in terms of going forward once you have that foundational knowledge about C programming and Objective-C then you can start transitioning to the iPhone or a Mac app or an iPad app I would recommend sticking to iPhone and iPad since that's really what we're going to be covering I won't get into detail on Mac apps for like the Mac App Store or anything like that. That's a whole nother ball game. There's a lot of differences between the two. Working with the command line tool is very different than working with the user interface, which would be the Cocoa application. So we won't touch the Mac user interface. We're just going to play around with the iPhone or the iPad interfaces. I won't be doing anything on the social network integrations for this class, uh, but I am I am posting some stuff, and I, I'm planning on doing a tutorial on uh, working with Facebook or Twitter uh, in in my website. So if you go to iPhone Dev TV slash blog you'll find some of the topics or I have a newsletter and there's links on the Skillshare page about that. But that's a little out of scope for this class. We want to focus on just learning first and then we'll start adding those intermediate and advanced topics. it's somewhat easy to create a flashcard application I guess it depends on, on what kind of bells and whistles you want a very basic one you could just flip um, between screens or you could just change the text so it's not super hard I think that the stuff that we'll be doing will set you up for building a flashcard style app I do have one friend who worked on a flashcard app he spent a lot of time on it so I know that you can definitely sink a lot of time into making it work really well Uh, Abraham, in terms of Android, I don't like Android. Uh, so when I taught the class at RIT to the 28 students, I did go over Android. And it wasn't a very good experience. Uh, things aren't as easy to work with. The learning curve is a little bit harder because the... My, I guess my biggest gripe was I don't have an Android device, and I was forced to use their emulator or their simulator and that's way slower than the iPhone simulator so it was really hard to dig into the Android development because it's super slow and I've got the latest MacBook Retina uh, it's jacked out with 16 gigabytes it's got the second highest processor and spec that you can buy and it was super slow so that was a big turnoff for me when I work with iPhone the simulator is super quick I showed you the demos, it just boots up right away. 
With Android, you have to wait minutes for it to load. It's it's ridiculous, and it's because it's it's a different way of doing the preview of how the app works. There's another Skillshare class if you're interested on Android development, and I would recommend that you take that. Uh, let me see if I can pull up that link. So if you go to the Skillshare website, they have the classes, and you should be able to find it here. Um, if that loads, it's not loading, so I'll just scroll down on this page. And you can see that Mark is teaching the build mobile apps for Android devices. So if you want to learn this, check out his class. His is $25. I don't know if he has any discounts. Uh, but Mark has been teaching classes for a while. He teaches on a bunch of topics. So check that out and see if that's what you're looking for. That didn't show. Sorry, I'm showing you the wrong one. Okay, we're, we're almost done here. This is the window I want to show you. I was showing the wrong one. Hopefully that's the right one now. Yes. So this is building mobile apps for Android devices. Check that out and see if that's what you're looking for. Okay. Transforming, I'll get into the integration with Facebook or social networks using some of Apple's APIs on my blog, uh, but I won't be doing that for this class. There's just too much information. In terms of translating Excel formulas into Xcode, it's possible. Uh, I don't know exactly how your Excel formulas work. If you post something on the discussions, some people might be able to help out. When you drag and drop stuff, it actually doesn't make any code. Uh, objects in Objective-C, user interfaces, are not just code like they are in something like C-sharp when you're working with Visual Studio or anything like that. So it's actually an archived object which gets unarchived and loaded into memory right away. So it's a little bit different and we'll be learning about that uh, in weeks two and three. I don't know if there's a voice recognition API, and I won't go over that. Uh, you'd have to Google. The only thing I know, that's a phone service, so that's not going to help. Yeah, I would Google around, um, see if any of the other students in the class know of something. Post something in the discussions. Yes, we'll learn how to work with APIs. Uh, that's all you do when you're a programmer. So. There's a lot of APIs that are local that we'll be working with. Now, if you're talking about a web service or something where it's querying Facebook or your own custom server, then we won't get into that. That's a little out of scope. But there's a lot of APIs in here that we'll be doing. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you for watching and. Have a good night. Uh, check back probably tomorrow for updates with all the links after we go through all these questions and just compile a list of answers. And if you have any other questions, just post something on the Skillshare website in the discussions area or send me an email at paulsolt at artworkevolution.com. I will be responding to Skillshare more frequently than I will be responding to specific emails. So keep that in mind. I want to try and keep the information on the Skillshare website. I'll see you later.